everybody, Titan here once again, and welcome back to another edition of Storytime, where I take a break from all things sim racing to bring you the weird, wonderful, interesting, tragic, and hilarious stories from the real world of motorsport. Now today, I've got the story of one of the most dominant machines to ever participate in Formula One, and it's also an icon of the sport we love. Ladies, gentlemen, non-binaries, F-18 Super Hornets, or whatever you think you are, I've got the story of the majestic and inimitable Ferrari F2004. Now let's face it, Ferrari was unstoppable in the early 2000s. Five straight titles for Michael Schumacher in which he won the majority of his 91 wins and took him to a total of seven world titles. A record that has stood for so long and yet is close to being matched if not beaten by a certain driver whose name we won't name because it would just degrade him to, he's only good because of that car. I won't go into the whole political side of things and whether Mosley and Bernie were giving them a helping hand because that's not relevant to the story. So we're leaving all of that out and we're just focusing on the car. So if you're one of those getting ready at your keyboards to type show us on the doll where Ferrari hurt you or you're just a jealous bitter Brit, well you're shit out of luck. So then, the car. Like virtually all Formula One cars within a time frame of regulations, it was simply an evolution of what came before. Back then the regulations were a little more stable, with very few if any major regulation changes between 1995 and 2009. In 1996 we saw the mandatory introduction of the high cockpit sides, and the banning of aero deflectors in front of the rear wheels, with effectively the same cars able to run all the way through into 1997. In 1998 we saw the introduction of a narrower track and groove tyres, but the bodywork was merely a simple evolution. And I've managed to illustrate this a little bit further by putting an image on your screen of various F1 cars between 1994 to the end of the Red Bull years. If you were to look at the Ferrari from 2001 up to 2004 from just the side profile, you would be forgiven for thinking they're just the same car, with a little bit of a tweak here and there. But really the F2004's oldest relative was the F2002 rather than the car they used in 2001. The 2002, designed by Ross Braun and Rory Byrne, was much lighter than its older brother and had much better handling due to its stupidly low centre of gravity. The engine was not on the same power level of the BMW or Mercedes in the rival Williams and McLaren cars, but it was less thirsty and lighter. A complete departure from Enzo Ferrari's ethos of power being the winner and not aero or lightness, which was a British ideology when it came to building racing cars. Still, it produced around 820 to 900 horsepower at 19,000 RPM and weighed just 600 kilos. Much lighter than the F1 cars of today, and much smaller, as you can see in this illustration that I made in Assetto Corsa. Bridgestone made tyres specifically for that car, and with the whole package together with Michael Schumacher in the car, it dominated. And it dominated hard. The F2002 won six of the opening seven rounds of the championship. The only one it not winning was Monaco. And then we had that finish at Austria. Let Michael Bay for the championship. Yeah, you know which one I'm on about. Still, after 19 rounds, it had won 15 of them. From round 1996 to 2001, Ferrari had been using the same basic design of gearbox, but received an overhaul for 2002. It was now made of military grade titanium to make it light. Braun and Byrne overhauled the aero and moved the exhaust to blow hot air onto the rear wing for added stability and away from the rear suspension. Because back then, you could. And just as a quick point before all the anoraks arrived, the F2002 didn't debut until round 3 into Lagos using a modified F2001 for Melbourne and Kuala Lumpur before that. I think I've cleared that one up. Cool, moving on. Interestingly, there was a small kerfuffle surrounding that car at its debut in Brazil. The team only took one F2002 to Brazil, which naturally went to Schumacher, with his spare car being an F2001, and Barrichello was also using the F2001. The two cars used different wheel rims and different spec tyres, so in effect, Schumacher had twice the allocation of tyres of any other driver on the grid. So Ferrari did the gentleman thing and took half of the tyres from each car. The car then dominated the rest of the season at a level not seen since 1988 or even 1992, with Schumacher winning 9 in the F2002 and 11 overall for the season, with teammate Rubens Barrichello getting 4 wins. The only race the F2002 failed to win was Monaco, with the F2001 only failing to win in Sepang. Schumacher meanwhile finished every race on the podium and won the title in record time, 
with Ferrari ending the Constructors' Championship with as many points as the rest of the teams combined. So how do you one-up that without getting diminishing returns? 2003 was a much closer fight with Williams and McLaren able to close up, and a three-way fight for the title lasting until the final couple of rounds. In mid-2003, Ferrari brought the F2003-GA, with GA being a tribute to Gianni Agnelli, the recently deceased head of Fiat. The 2003 car wasn't quite as OP as the previous year's car, with the F2003 having a penchant for being too heavy on the tyres, which caused them a lot of problems during the European-wide heatwave of that year. Then we get to 2004. Aldo Costa, who now works for Mercedes, Rory Byrne and Ross Braun, took all the best parts of the 2002, the best bits of the 2003, and made them have a baby together. The periscope exhausts were made smaller and brought more towards the centre of the car to improve the aerodynamic efficiency even further. The rear wing was made slightly bigger, and the suspension fine-tuned to reduce the excessive wear that plagued them in 2003, especially in hotter weather. And they managed to make it even lighter, with further advancements made in materials and construction. The weight distribution was improved, the centre of gravity made even lower, and the mechanical package much more durable and reliable. Testing started at Fiorano, and when it was established it worked and wasn't going to kill anybody, Ferrari took it to Imola where they could test it back to back with the old car. Back then, testing wasn't limited to when and where the FIA told you you could. Using data collected from the previous year and provided the car could keep the tyre temperatures under control, Braun and his crew reckoned that the car should be half a second quicker than the old one. Schumacher went two seconds quicker. Which is a good thing, right? The car's exceeded expectations. Well done, lads. Let's go racing. But no. Ferrari were convinced they'd screwed up. They stuck it on a weigh bridge, and the car was well within the minimum weight limits. Meanwhile, the Michael was grinning like a Cheshire cat, and was secretly hoping that this car was the final car, and not a massive cock-up. It wasn't. And even more weirdly, the car was better over the course of a race and not just over one lap. McLaren and Williams had good cars over one lap, but the Ferrari got better and better as the distance went up. Barrichello tested it at Mugello and said that the F2004 was the only car that he could take some of Mugello's fastest corners without even lifting. And with Ferrari now the only top team running Bridgestone tyres, the Japanese company was now putting more focus on that car and making tyres specifically for that car and then supplying the same tyres to Sauber, Jordan and Minardi. Like in 2002, Schumacher won the opening five races and retired from Monaco after colliding with Juan Pablo Montoya behind the safety car, which allowed Jarno Trulli to take his only win. But that little hiccup didn't stop the prancing horse. It went on to claim 15 wins in an 18 race season, with the Michael winning 13 of them. It's a record for most wins by a driver in a season until Sebastian Vettel took 13 wins in the 2013 season. And ironically, both of those feats came at the end of their respective domination years. The F2004, in a way, was the swan song of the Ferrari dominance years of the early 2000s. But instead of fizzling out like Williams or even McLaren have done, they went out with a flamboyant bang. Because... Italian. The F2002 was the precursor, but the F2004 was the one that we all remember. For Ferrari fans, it's the Holy Grail. For non-Ferrari fans, it was a pain in the ass, But, as I've aged and now done all the research into it, I've come to appreciate it a little more now than I did when it was in service. Sure, nobody wants to watch the same people winning all the time and dominance is boring, regardless of whether it's the New England Patriots, Ferrari, Manchester United, Barcelona, or even Mercedes today. But it's amazing how opinions can change over time and with a little bit of the old rose-tinted glasses. Sometimes, accomplishment is so spectacular that we need about 15 years for it to sink in. And this car is where the dominance of Michael Schumacher ended. For 2005, the FIA said a set of tyres had to last for a whole race, which was a bullshit rule, and they raised the front wings and the dynamic finally shifted. Michelin made better tyres. Well, except for that one race, obviously. And Fernando Alonso stopped the juggernaut that was the red team from Maranello. A run of six constructors' titles and five drivers' titles in a row, something not even Fangio, Senna, Clark, or Hamilton could manage, ended. But to be fair, 
Prior to 2000, Ferrari had been waiting since Jody Schechter in 1979 for a driver's title. And since the days of the early 20th century, the Tifosi, which are Ferrari's die-hard fans, go into every season hoping that maybe, just maybe, those days will be back. If only for one season. Between 2000 and 2005, that black horse on a yellow shield trampled all who challenged them. Great for those that are the Ferrari, but for the rest of us, boy did we love to hate them. And yes, I've said some things about Ferrari in the past that people might not necessarily agree with. But like I've already said, maybe you just need to sit down and look a little deeper to work out what it is they did so well that the others couldn't. They took advantage of some pretty nifty advancements in construction at exactly the right time. Shame they can't get their asses in gear these days. It's also a car that's in everybody's top five of iconic Formula One cars, along with the MP44, the Williams FW15B, the Lotus 49, and whichever other car you choose to fill the gap with. It's also, annoyingly for me at least, one of the best looking. Sleek, neat, lacking all the aero appendages that sprouted a couple of years later, not that other drivers got to see how good it looked on track because it was so far ahead they weren't even able to see the back of it. Now people love to cry about how it's the car that got that driver his wins, especially if that driver is one you don't particularly like. Would Zolt Baumgartner, the Hungarian guy that drove for Jordan that year, have won the title in the F2004? Probably. Would Esteban Gutierrez have won the title in the 2015 Mercedes? Probably. But would it have been as easy as the Michael or Lewis made it for themselves? Probably not. And this is it with Formula 1. If you have an already great car and stick the best driver of that generation in it, well you might as well get handed the title in Australia. In 2018, five records were still claimed by the F2004. But with the way the cars are now with their wide tyres and super powerful hybrid engines, the car will be consigned to the history books. But at least I can say, I was there to watch it. And it now begs another question. Can the Mercedes of 2019 go even further than the domination of the F2004? What do you think? So thank you very much for watching. I've been Aidan Millward and if you've enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up and if you want to see more then click on the subscribe button with the bell notification what's it on so you can get all the latest from this channel. I've also got a Discord server if that's your thing, so come on in and join the chat as there's a pretty good community brewing in there now. Thanks as always go to the people on screen who are patrons of this channel, and if you want to join them, then the details are in the description and in the end card that's coming up in the next 15 seconds or so. So until next time, have a great day wherever you are in the world, and goodbye. <laughs>